Uh, so whenever I talk to somebody unfam unfamiliar with TLA+, uh, I tell them a lot about writing specification and how great it is, and the very first question I usually get is, what's about the implementation? So I know I have this great specification, but no implementation, and how, how do I make sure that the implementation satisfies the high-level specification? And this talk and the talk after are about how to connect the uh, specification with its implementation, and Ivan and Finn are going to show us Pigo, uh, who generates Go code out of a Pascal specification. All right, thanks everybody for coming. This is so exciting. I haven't been around so, so many uh, TLA plus interested folks. <laughs> maybe ever. Uh, so this is really great. So uh, today we're going to be telling you about a project. It's an academic project. It's open source. Uh, we're continuing to work on it. And it's collaboration between Finn, myself, uh, Renato, and Matthew. Renato and Matthew just finished their master's thesis, and they're off trying to find a job so they couldn't make it. Uh, but we'll be telling you about a project called Pigo. And essentially, at the high level, the way to think about it is that it's trying to mechanize the generation of an, ex of, uh, an implementation like Marcus said, in, in Goland. And so that's basically what the talk's going to be about. But to start off, just to motivate a little bit uh, why we went ahead and did this, you know, distributed systems are everywhere. They're widely used. Of course, many of you are familiar with these. You know, they're deployed in large, uh, large data centers, like this enormous data center from Google. And, you know, they're used for all sorts of stuff, right? Uh, the problem, of course, is that uh, the subtraction that they are frequently built on has these underlying challenges, uh, like the fact that you're dealing with an asynchronous network, you're dealing with latency variation, you're dealing with failures of the hardware, dealing with failures of the network, switches, fabric, uh, various delays, partial failures, some nodes might be down, some might be up, and so forth. And so this is a great motive for trying to apply formal methods, because you can explore a variety of these circumstances and trying to figure out how can you, you know, find all the bugs that um, that you could. So, so oftentimes these things are deployed in production with bugs, and uh, and there's uh, and there's a ton of these examples, right? And so I'm just picking a couple of uh, headlines of data loss, degraded performance, service outages. Uh, these are the kinds of things that you know even large companies are uh, have to admit because we all experience them. So when AWS goes down and takes down Reddit and you know Airbnb and everything else with it. Uh, people kind of know, right? <laughs> so people know and they ask questions. So the, so the bottom line here, I think, uh, is that oftentimes the descriptions of protocols that are used to build these distributed systems, they're really not enough. Because if you just describe a thing on paper, maybe in code, you're not going to cover all the edge cases. You know, it's really difficult to correspond this description with the eventual implementation. And so there's a lot of academic work, uh, which is kind of where I'm coming from. I'm a faculty. Uh, and there's work at top-level conferences that basically document all the various ways in which uh, these distributed systems have issues and all the various which ways in which developers struggle in trying to you know, ascertain quality. So the, the big problem that I think in this space for distributed systems is that there's this enormous gap between you know, this design that we basically sketch out on like a napkin of like, let's say, oh, maybe the, ne the internet, uh, and then the eventual, you know, realization of that design in, in code. And so the, the point of this project that I'll tell you about today is to basically bridge this design gap and to potentially eliminate it in some, in some instances. So uh, there's a lot of interesting related work in this context. As an academic, I always think about related work and like what's the state of the art. So here's just a couple of uh, things. Some of them got mentioned. So P-sharp got mentioned earlier today. Uh, but there's basically, uh, you can think of work that tries to bridge this gap uh, from a couple of different directions. One is in the uh, proof assistant world. Another one is in the model checking world. Uh, the proof assistants require huge effort, huge expertise. Basically, you have to become a full-time mathematician. Uh, model checking, kind of limited, uh, you know, but that's kind of what we use in TLC. Uh, but model checking, of course, requires this model, which is going to be frequently abstract. And then there's, you know, a bunch of systems kind of work that tries to use testing, tracing, you know, runtime verification, all sorts of debugging techniques. 
so the, the focus of this talk, of course, is model checking, TLC. In case uh, you don't know what model checking is, you, know, you basically have this model and the property, that's the specification, you give it to a model checker, the model checker explores the model, you know, proves it relative to a specification, and either it's correct or you get this nice trace, right? And you saw a trace earlier today that, that you can use to then debug the model. The, uh, so the, like, here's a very trivial example in TLA Plus. Since a lot of you have used TLA Plus, I'll just sort of uh, just show it to you briefly to say that, you know, usually there's some uh, initialization where you kind of say, like, what is my, my set of states in my model? And then you define a transfer function that says, you know, how can I transform that state? What are all the possible states that I can generate from that initial configuration? And then you define a property that says something like, in this bank example, uh, bank transfer should always preserve positive balances. We're not, not allowed to have negative balances at a bank. And so then I have this theorem that a spec implies my valid balances specification. I give that to a model checker and they basically derive, in this case, they derive a bug. And so this bug would be an error trace that tells me the specific uh, configuration that the model checker found that violates that initial model. In this case, Alice you know, has insufficient funds, which is a problem. So this talk is about Pigo and um, sort of a language that we build on top of Pluscal called Modular Pluscal to facilitate this um, mechanization of generating an implementation. And at the, the high level, it's basically a compiler. Uh, some people think of it as th synthesis. I think of it more as compilation. Uh, it basically takes a model in this language called modular pluscal or pluscal, uh, and it's able to output um, Go-based code that implements either the concurrent version of the model or the distributed version of the model that you can then go deploy and run. And essentially, from a like to simplify that diagram a little bit, this is the workflow that we're imagining. So the developer would actually write the model in the spec, and they would actually model check it using TLC. Then they would give it to this black box, uh, Pigo, with possibly a few, a few more inputs that we'll talk about. The source is compiled, and then you get this run, running system. So the idea is to try to transition in an automated way from a design to an implementation. So the, the immediate trade-offs that you guys might think about, you're like, wow, this is magic. I want this, right? Uh, so OK, there's going to be some limitations, right? You're not going to get it for free. So the, the great thing about this is that it's compatible with this existing ecosystem of tools. So it kind of works with Pluscal, TLA Plus, TLC. So we haven't built our own model checker because we don't need to. There already is one. So that's what we're building on that work. Mechanization, of course, means less implementation work. And of course, it also means that you have this one hopefully definitive version of your system. So you keep one copy in Pluscal module Pluscal, and then you just generate the implementation from it. So now you don't have this divergence potentially between these two different things. Uh, the problem is there's no real free lunch because the reason you're using model checking in the first place is because you, know, you want to model check it, so it has to be small and abstract and capture just the right things that you want to capture. And earlier there were questions around like, how do you include this? Why do you not include that? Well, that's the, the art of model checking, so to speak. It's going to differ uh, between different systems. And the things that you're leaving out are things like the environment, for example, right? Like the file system or the network or, you know, the key value store. All these things are going to be not part of your spec, and they're going to have to be part of the eventual implementation. So the question is, when I do this translation from, you know, from a model to a running system, how do I capture the environment? How do I connect my model to the environment? That's kind of one of the key concerns in module Pluscal. And it's n there's no free lunch. You're going to have to kind of give it to us. You're going to have to specify what the environment is. Uh, the other obvious thing is there might be bugs. So this compiler that we've built has like tens of thousands of lines of code in it. Uh, we're not perfect programmers. We have good test cases. But the compiler itself is not verified. So that, that should, you know, uh, that's definitely a limitation. And then there's this problem of software evolution. You know, if you actually change the implementation, because you want to make it go faster, because our compiler is not super optimized, then all of a sudden you've diverged, right? Now your implementation is different, so how do you reconcile it with the original model? You could make changes to the model only, but sometimes that's not possible. So this problem of software evolution is another kind of core limitation to this thing. Uh, so today, in today's talk, I'm not going to tell you about how we actually compile. 
So this is not a compiler's group. Uh, there's a lot of interesting compiler magic. If you're interested in compiler magic, uh, partly overviewed on this slide, this is kind of all the guts within the compiler. Uh, come talk to us. Uh, Finn built most of the compiler, uh, and we can talk about what's inside of it and how we do you know, tape inference and uh, nerdy things like that. Uh, so instead, we're going to talk about modular Pluscal. We'll try to motivate why we think we need it. We'll explain how to use it. We'll give you a couple of examples. We'll give you a demo of the thing actually compiling and then running on Azure of a small example. Um, but we won't talk about the compiler. And then hopefully, hopefully you'll be satisfied by that. Cool. So Finn is going to do the gnarly bits. OK. All right. Mic is on. OK. So. Um, We'll be going through this in uh, kind of a building up sort of manner. Um, so we've already said we have all these concerns about the environment. I'm now going to sort of spell out how you go from looking at Pluscal and being like, OK, how do I implement this to having kind of a model for how you actually implement it. So here we have two pieces of code. Uh, the top one is a fragment of Pluscal. Actually, show of hands, uh, who's kind of used Pluscal? OK, some people. I'll, this talk is kind of fairly agnostic about what you've seen before, so I will try to spell out what, uh, what's going on as it happens. Um, so basically, just this uh, is just a fragment of Pluscal that's a label which models a blocking network read. Um, and the bottom code is not really Go, but kind of Go that fits on a slide. Basically, it's not a blocking network read. So you'll see a, that's a lot of stuff. We model the blocking network read. And if you try to actually compile that the obvious way, just take the expressions, get the values you expect, emulate the global variables in the spec, yada, yada, that's not a blocking network read. It's not even close. So. You also notice all of this stuff is for the model checker's benefit. Um, if you're actually writing this implementation, you wouldn't need to say, oh, and by the way, wait for the buffer to have stuff in it before you read. I mean, that's going to get taken care of by the blocking nature of the network call. So in a way, this very abstract specification is not abstract enough in the sense that it's the wrong kind of abstract. So let's explore some iteratively more what we're actually doing with Pigo solutions to this. Uh, so you could try to use macros to clean up that code. You probably do this if you write pluscal. Like, no one's going to copy paste the same three lines over and over. That's classic macro food. Um, so you can put network read, which just expands the previous slide's code. Um, and that's pretty nice. The pluscal is a lot cleaner. Um, also, you could try to get a bit smart with this. Pigo, as a compiler, can see that's a macro. You could try to do some fancy replacement where the implementation of the macro is something that's closer to a network read. Um, you got still kind of some teething issues, though. So we're still using global variables from a macro. You know, that's fine. The pluscal works. Um, but it kind of gets a bit messy semantically. Like, pluscal is based on this idea of processes. So you have different processes that interact with the global variables to communicate, which is fine for model checking. But um, you get this weird issue where the macro sort of using the macro imply, actually, sorry. It's more like, if you use this macro, anyone can use it. Anyone can touch that global variable in any way. And you get this huge laundry list of don't do that. Also, you can't give two different processes two different points of view, at least not in a semantically obvious way to a compiler. You can't give them two different points of view on some kind of communication. Like, you have one process that maps to a very simple node that just connects to some main server. And then you have the main server, which has connections to loads of things. Um, so that's not really going to help. And unfortunately, you also notice a weird issue in this pseudo go at the bottom. 
read network is one big global function. We kind of missed the point that the network is usually like a, an object. You have a reference to it. Uh, different parts of the code might have different things. You should set it up somehow. All of that stuff goes missing also. So it's kind of a cool idea, though. Let's try and make this work a little bit better. So we invent a new kind of ma macro. We call this an archetype because it's not a process anymore. Um, previously, we're assuming we're in a Pluscal process. And processes just describe this is one process. A macro, sorry, not a macro, an archetype is archetypal. You can stamp it out as many times as you like. It is not a process. It is the template for a process parameterized on its resources. So the, you can then pass in a network, which is an abstraction. Um, so this is still very nice clean code. It's the same line count. So yeah, OK, that's still good for the model checker. And you can also provide any number of implementations. Uh, do I have? I did not have a bubble for that. Sorry. Um, the important thing, though, is network. You can now tell the network is an object. You can look at this, and you can track who uses the network. So the code the that you can generate can also track who uses the network and can be based on like, passing the network around and using it. That matches more the kind of idea of resources as a thing that actually exists. So basically what we've done is we've gone from implicit resources that are completely ad hoc to resources that exist as a semantic unit that you can pass around. And now a compiler can actually have a half decent chance at guessing what you are actually trying to do. So um, this basically summarizes what I was what I was just saying. You have this um, goal of isolating our abstract definition from its environment, whatever that is. And so you have these archetypes. They are only allowed to interact with their parameters. So you know now which bits of the system they're touching. And these arguments will encapsulate the environment in some way. And also, importantly, we never said how the network behaved in that last example. So you can take these and define what the model checker should see. And you can also take these and define what other things like implementations should see. Um, so here's kind of a smorgasbord of the language we're defining. Don't worry. We're going to go through like the actual details in the next few slides. But just to point out, uh, we have our little example there, which is the uh, just some kind of a server that's reading the network. We have an instantiation of it to be to be explained later, and we, having a, we have a mapping macro to be explained later, which defines, you'll notice that's very similar to the original Pluscal code, just templated on a bunch of stuff, uh, which defines what a network read should actually look like in uh, model checker land. So uh, we're now going to sort of construct and describe how you do this for a very, very simple example. Example is very simple in terms of model, so we can talk about the language and don't get distracted. So it's a server. It serves things on a file system. Uh, it gets requests and replies. <coughs> very, very simple. Um, in Pluscal, it would plausibly look like this, macros notwithstanding. Uh, so you have this read message. OK, well, you have the global variable. And you move stuff around in and out of the global variable to implement reading. And you do the same for writing. So you have the same old waiting for the buffer and stuff like that. And also, we decided to be really lazy here and just say that the file system, we don't really care about that. That's not the point of this example. There's people do this. We've described this in previous talks. So we're just going to have a constant called web page. OK, so now we can't even see what the file system is at all. We don't know where it is. So that's going to be fun to implement. So let's turn this into modular Pluscal and see what happens. So first, network and file system are clearly stated. We can see them now. 
Uh, network read is exactly what it was in the previous slide. And you can then write to the network to send something. And by the way, these are all overloaded sort of read and assignment for variables. We felt this was convenient um, in case someone's wondering about what that syntax is. It's the same as assignment and stuff. And then you have the file system. And now it's quite clear you want to read that path and then send it to the network. So this is now obvious from the code, and a compiler could plausibly look at that and say, oh, I see. Here, here's a skeleton of how this actually works with the slots for the different resources. So just to then show you, again, the same thing from the big smorgasbord before, we got a mapping macro. Uh, we define how you read from and write to the thing. Um, we've got these little templating variables that uh, help you say what this does. So in read, variable is, um, I skipped a step. Variable is a global variable you are mapping over. So you do need global variables in Pluscal to actually communicate. So semantically, dollar variable is some global variable that you've decided to subject to this mapping macro. So we wrap it around in this thing, and we yield what the archetype should actually see. And for write, you have variable again, which is the value right now of the variable that you're manipulating, the global one. Then you have value, which is the thing you're writing to it. And you can do whatever you like to make these two things match up. In this case, we do the thing that you have to do to simulate a network write you, with a buffer. So you await the buffer size being correct. And when you yield, what you're doing is you're assigning to the variable. So this all expands out to some pretty obvious plus cal. But just, uh, that's how this construct works. So here, we've got the blocking read, same old. And here, we've got the buffered network write. Uh, again, straightforward plus cal done in such a way to make it abstractable and templatable. So, and now the fun part, the laziest way to write a mapping macro you probably could have. So, you yield a constant. That's fine. That's valid. That's an expression you can do. Um, as long as you're okay with that in terms of model checking, go ahead. And writing is banned. You can't do that. Um, if anyone ever tries, you assert false to ensure that it blows up, up on them as fast as possible because we haven't defined writing to the file system for this spec and we're not going to bother writing anything interesting there. Did that? Oh, I see. And the missing piece, which describes kind of how these things fit together, this is how you define a process. So from PlusCal, you have various syntaxes for processes, where you usually say, like, process, the process name. Then you have a body that defines sort of what it does. Here, we've done that in an archetype. So here's how you stamp out a process that is that archetype over a certain environment. So you have the network. Um, and you pass in some stuff. And here, we have a way of saying, OK, when you see um, an indexing into network, each the network is a collection of these pipes. So when you index, index into network, each indexed part is a pipe. And it follows the mapping macro we showed you a bit ago. File system, same. If you index into it, you get a constant. If you try to write to an index of it, you die. Um, and so server is an instance of a server. And it's got all the stuff expanded out so that you can then run it through Pluscal and run it in, uh, check it in TLC or whatever you like. To note, ones without that fan fancy um, pattern thing exist. They're just the same thing without that. They're just not super interesting, and we couldn't fit them into the example. Um, so to review, what did we just gain here? Uh, Pluscal has. Uh, this abstract environment, but it's really unclear where all the stuff goes. So you have to, there's no good way to automatically compile that. So you have to go in and edit everything, and you're losing a lot of any guarantees you might have from a compiler doing this for you. 
Modular plus scale is isolated from the environment. So, hey, you can basically count on it, and you shouldn't need to edit what Pigo is generating. And so, if your spec evolves, if you realize, I don't know, if you want, if you've got something that's already running in production, and you need to add an extra feature to some protocol, say someone releases a new RFC, and you need to get that to happen. Well, since we've compiled most of the broad semantics of what your program is doing, you can change your spec, bubble check it again, make sure it actually makes sense. That's still up to you. Um, and you can just apply an update. And it can go out, and you can pipeline that. You can compile it as you like. So we've got this workflow that Ivan was already summarizing before. Uh, user writes a model in MPCAL, as an abbreviation for modular PlusCAL. Uh, Pigo compiles the model to PlusCAL. <coughs> then you can do what you usually do and define correctness properties, check it in TLC, etc. Pigo also compiles it to Go. Um, so then you can choose what those resources are. Assuming it corresponds to whatever abstraction you did, um, then you can bootstrap the thing together in a custom main function. You still have to write that. And ideally, your thing will deploy, and it will work, because we wrote out all the complicated interleaving related parts for you. And all you had to do was to make sure that you know how to read a file system, read a network, send and receive, stuff like that. So now we'll be talking a bit about, concretely, how do you actually compile this. We showed kind of how it corresponds to PlusCal. Now let's see how it corresponds to Go. This gets fun. Feel free to ask me later for some of it. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so modular PlusCal supports regular process declarations. In fact, if you have a model checking only process that you just want to throw in there, yes, you can do that. Of course, archetypes and processes don't really mix that well. You'll have to heavily refactor to get those to go from one to the other usually. But yes, it does support those. Um, so as we were saying, the and thanks for the question. That's good. Um, and so let's talk about the concrete implementation for a bit. Um, so compiling modular plus cal to go. Um, so we have this goal. Um, this is basically a refinement, which is a fun word I learned uh, about a month ago in a formal methods reading group. Um, so the model uh, will show you all these possible executions and ways things can work. and what Pigo will do is it will write code that matches one of them. And it will use that to its advantage to not have to write strange things like calls to randomizers for selecting a member of a set. Uh, no, we just picked the first one. Uh, because that is technically valid. So environment is modeled um, abstractly. So what we need to do is we need to get some Go code that interacts with this unspecified environment in a correct way. And we need to have a look at how TLC explores behaviors. So we, ha so we can replicate some interleaving of that, though there is some gnarly details we will get into right now. So just to bring back the server for a bit, uh, let's add an archetype. Uh, so this is moving towards our final demo, which will be a server with a load balancer. There'll be a client. We will get to that. Um, so basically, the, our point here is we have two processes, and TLC will be exploring interleavings between them. So we have to make a program that runs some interleaving. And to remind us, um, PlusCal has labels. They define atomic steps. 
So for each label, that everything you do in that label will happen at once. Um, and there are some interleavings that are techni we're technically allowed to do. And there's some that just don't work causally. You can't hit the second part of load balancer before hitting the first part. Yes, it is a loop, so you will eventually hit that. But initially, you won't. <clears throat> so the trivial solution we did not do is have some kind of fancy runtime scheduler which takes all the different blocks and just tries to execute them in some dynamic ad hoc way. Um, no, that's not going to work in a distributed environment. We want to be able to do fancy things like, oh, it really was a network, so you don't need to lock that. Um, so we want to get concurrency. Um, and we use the fact that we told, in the previous step, we told you to pull out all of, your, uh, all of the details of your resources into somewhere separate, um, so that now, to get at the environment, you have to go through your resources. So we have a metric for externally visible actions. You can do whatever you like, but for anyone to see it, it has to go into a resource. Um, so uh, yeah, we try to get as much concurrency as possible while still being actually safe. So first, the easy case, print statements. Yes, technically, that's an externally visible thing. We're cheating. So this does not use a resource, so you can run it whenever you like, um, except for the bit where it prints something. It's completely invisible, so we don't have to work very hard for this at all. You just write the Go code that does that, done. So the more interesting cases are where you have some kind of contention, like you're both reading from the network. Um, something has to happen here. This really varies depending on what you're trying to do. Um, so we let the implementation of that resource dictate how safe it is to do what. We have a complete emulation of actual Pluscal globals, because we can compile also Pluscal, but it's less helpful. So you can lock that. You can have like a distributed key value store that em emulates your variables for you. You could also do something way more efficient. We support both of these things. So yeah, if you need exclusive access, you can do it. If you don't, you don't have to. But we just have to generate something that accesses the resource in a pattern that allows you to, at maximum, have complete global locks on everything. So for each archetype, we generate a Go function. Um, so you'll see in a minute that we it'll, you just got a bunch of somewhat repetitive Go code in a function and that models these different steps. And for each step, what we do is you have an acquire phase where you ask all the resources, uh, let me have you. Um, they will do whatever it is that it takes to do that. You then execute all the statements, a compiled equivalent of them, in order. And at the end, you release the resources. Well, mostly. Is this always safe? No. Classic database problem. If you acquire things in different orders, the same two things from two different places, you can run into a deadlock where each thing has the other thing's needed item. So let's quickly fix that. We sort the things. Then we do what we said before and acquire them, execute statements in order, release all resources at the end. So it's pretty simple. I'm noticing I'm running a bit low on time. So to just skim over this, uh, we have a pretty simple argument um, where if you, have, if you don't use any resources, you're fine. If you have disjoint sets, you're fine. If you have overlapping sets, if you access them in order and their synchronization works, you're fine. So one last problem before I get to that demo is function mapping. You know that thing we just casually used all over the place. That now, if you actually do that what you ha in uh, the implementation, what you have is a collection of resource implementations. Accessing that collection at a runtime-based value 
means you cannot statically analyze what collection, what resource you're actually accessing. So all of a sudden, sorting gets a bit not possible at compile time. So our current solution, uh, talk to me later if you want to discuss better ways to do this, but our current solution is the entire function, sorry, that way I already talked about that. So we just, no, I've actually covered this entire slide. Sorry, I confused myself. So um, our solution is we just take them whenever they happen in the statement they are so that you've got whatever value it is you're using to index them. And we have kind of a transactional model. Um, so if it turns out you can't acquire the thing, we have a failure case for that. And you abort, you release all the things, and you retry. Also very much like a kind of database. So to summarize, how to actually run a step with full generality. Um, so you have this kind of loop for retries. You, require, you acquire all the ones you can order uh, in order. You do things. Whenever you hit the case where you have one that's function mapped, you try to acquire it. If you need to retry, you abort everything and go retry. If it's a fatal error, die. Um, then in the end, you release all the things. So um, as I've gone over quite a lot, Pigo doesn't really know how your resources are implemented. That's up to you. And we have a contract for how to implement it. So it's been kind of hinted at strongly throughout what I've been talking about so far, what that contract is. Um, so you need to acquire. You need to read and write. You need to be able to commit at the end. And you need to be able to abort if you're restarting. So um, our, if you want to write one of these resources, here is your interface. Um, so that gets called when you're setting up. Um, that's how when you're tearing down the transaction at the end. That's how you abort to discard whatever it was you're doing. And that's how you sort them for, um, <coughs> thing, for when you're doing the sorting step at the beginning. So the other thing. There's two kinds of errors, which we distinguish. This is more of a kind of detail for how the Go has to deal with it, because error is just a type that has no information. So we distinguish between actual errors, which are fatal, unless the resource hides them. And like you can make a reconnecting network connection if you like. But if you don't handle that, just throw the error, and we don't know how to handle that. And or you can restart, and it'll just Unlock, um, and then we just sort of retry. So those are your options as a resource implementer. And now here's the bit where I mess up all the windowing and why this was not done in full screen as I try to demo this to you. So just to note, our demo is for load balancer, the thing we've been talking about so far. Um, not that one, that one. Um, and the entire demo script is publicly available on our GitHub wiki, so feel free to play around with that. We have a branch called tlaconf-demo, which contains all the files and some setup instructions for how to get to our environment. I have done all this setup, however, to save you some time. So let's have a look. Uh, first, let's look at the load balancer the actual spec for a bit. I'm going to gloss over a lot of this because we just saw most of it in the slides. Oh, look, the TCP channel going past. Web pages, archetypes. I added some print statements for the actual live run for in a minute. Um, the server. Oh, look, the client. Let's talk about that for a moment just to point out what it's doing. Here's a more fun example of resources. A client, we don't know what a client is. How do you model that? You don't, really. Uh, so for model checking purposes, well, for general purposes, the client takes a stream of what it should do and outputs a stream of what happened. So you tell it, hey, request these things. And in the model checker, you can just give it a list of things to request. 
and the output will be what it got. Um, and in the implementation, you can do very much the same thing. You can just remote control it by pushing and pulling in the different streams. So that's how we operate with that. And here we have our set of instances. And down below, we have the bit where the Pascal translation goes. So, OK, more windowing shenanigans, this time on the other screen where I find the demo script and find the compile commands. So let's actually just run the compilation to show you how it works. It's already been mostly done here. OK, so let's quit that. And here to compile mpcal, there's no options. There's only one way to do it. You can just run pgo on the thing. And away we go. All right, let me just copy the next thing while it's going. And that's just a normal successful pgo run. We'll report errors. We parse it. We do all sorts of fun stuff. But we're just showing you how it generally works. So let's look at the load balancer. And down we go. Just to give you a really brief view that, yes, we do have um, actual pluscal down here. It's got processes, got global variables. It looks a bit weird because of our macro engine, but yeah, it's, there it is. I will spare you the TLA plus translation because it just gets longer and more tedious as you go on. But speaking of which, we actually haven't translated it to TLA plus yet. I'm just foreshadowing that I won't show you that. So. Um, you can do all this from the toolbox, um, but we're doing it from the terminal because this is a server and exporting is hard. Um, so there you go. Now we've translated that to TLA+. And let's model check it. We have a simple model checking scenario, again, uh, in the terminal. So let me just cat you the things. So we're going to model check it with some constants. Well, one client, two servers, and one load balancer. This, this matches our demo setup. And we're also having a buffer size of one just to keep things fast, because we don't want to sit down for like three minutes while it figures that out. So next line, this is how you do a model checker run in the terminal. And. All right, and all the print statements from the model fired. Obviously, you wouldn't do that in like a real model, but it's a demo thing. Um, so uh, the thing passed. So that means that plausibly, for whatever you were actually doing, which probably took you a lot longer than this, um, you can just go ahead and yeah, you've checked it. So now let's go ahead and actually build the thing. Uh, let me just <coughs> copy the build command first. And so uh, for this one, pgo takes a little bit of a config file, actually kind of similar to the model checker, because as we said before, we have to reasonably pretend we are the model checker. So we're just going to dump this thing in our go path. Uh, it's going to create a module called load balancer. Um, and we put the same set of constants in there because pgo needs to know the constants too. So here we go. Let's compile that. And we've generated some code. So let's have a little bit of a whirlwind tour through what that code actually looks like. So go slash source slash load load balancer load balancer dot go. We just generated all this. There's a lot of boilerplate, um, but I just want to show you, look, there's the load balancer uh, that you remember from the slides. Actually, let's look at the server, because you've seen, we spent more time on that. There's a server. It takes one extra thing called self, which if you've known, done any pluscal is an implicit parameter to a process. Uh, it also takes the mailboxes. It takes the file system. and You've got a really weird way to write a while true. Um, 
but that's just how our cogen works. And some very elaborate instantiations of that algorithm we talked about a few slides ago. So there we go. And we said we have to bring your own main, so we cooked one up ahead of time. Here's the main. Here you can see it importing that Go, th that Go module we just saw. There's some boilerplate, some notes about, um, we just inlined the configuration here. Each thing maps to a certain host in our Azure, little Azure cluster. Uh, we do some miscellaneous setup. Um, we construct the um, resources. So the mailboxes is just a library thing that we provide. We provide actually a bunch of pre-built ones I'll go over when the demo is over. Probably skip over given the shortage of time. And here we just launch the, depending on which role we have, we launch the load balancer. Uh, here you take the path, you create the file system resource, resource launch the server. And here, the most fun one, that's how you puppeteer the client. You create the two little channels, and you have an infinite loop that just keeps asking for three things round robin. So now, for the last part and my second potential jeopardization of the windowing, here I have a little Tmux session uh, with all the four things right ready to go. So top left, you've got the load balancer. Top right, you've got the client. And on the bottom left, bottom right, you've got the two servers. So here we go. It's configured to wait for them all to be set up to start. Go and go. So just waiting for all the Azure machines to wake up. Um, oh, and the last one came up. And uh, if you, for some reason, have photographic memory, you would have noticed that there's a wait for the client so that it doesn't just spew stuff forever really, really fast. So you can see the load balancer is getting the requests, relaying it to the servers. And because it's a round robin load balancer, you will continue to see the two sort of sets of records from the servers being completely balanced. So just to reiterate what's going on here, we went from a spec that models uh, servers, load balancers, clients, and we've gone through model checking it, and now we compiled it, and all we had to do was write a main function and do a bit of plumbing, and it works. So, now, uh, back to the presentation, and let me just fix the presenter view as well. So since we're running low on time, I think uh, sort of uh, skip over a bunch of things. But um, yeah. if you're interested in more details, uh, you should come talk to us. Uh, we have more kind of slides on um, how the runtime basically works. Uh, we have uh, a few more slides on the actual um, kind of experiments that we've done with uh, a couple of different specifications. Uh, one of them was this replicated key value store, which is a little bit more interesting. We have some uh, experience with building a Paxos spec and a RAF specification in uh, module Pascal as well. Uh, I don't have any results for those that I can report. There's also some uh, experiments that we've run with performance. Obviously, our performance is not going to satisfy uh, those of you who like to write your Go manually. Uh, it's not going to match it exactly, so it's a little bit subpar right now. Uh, but it's also not terrible. It's not like an order of magnitude. It's, uh, it's just maybe 10, 10 20 percent um, performance decrease. Uh, there's a bunch of things that we're trying to work on uh, going forward. We really want to uh, certify the compilation. Uh, so that would be like the, the really amazing thing that we could get. Uh, there's a bunch of fault tolerance and kind of performance uh, improvements that we want to uh, work on as well. Basically a work in project, uh, work in uh, progress. Uh, so kind of the, the high level takeaways, uh, we talked about Pigo. Uh, I told you about how it uh, specifically separates uh, the environment from the actual implementation. And then also, Finn demoed for you in detail about how to actually get it to go into TLA plus so that you can model check it, and then how you can output runnable uh, Go code that you can deploy and, and get your system up and running. So this project is online. Uh, happy to chat with all of you more. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thanks very much. Uh, I guess we have time for one question. Who raises his or her hand the fastest? 
Well, I have a bunch of questions. Um, so then I, I get started here. Um, how difficult would it be to exchange the Go part with some other implementation language? Um, so I'll probably take that one. Um, so really, most of the compiler front end doesn't care that this is Go. Uh, we basically just at a certain point decide, hey, we're generating Go, and we sort of template it out using all the stuff. But fundamentally, yeah, as long as you can give sort of good strategies for implementing all the TLA plus operators and all the details, there's no big reason why it has to be Go. It just happened to be convenient. OK, thanks. Yeah, OK, so next, well, once again, thanks for the talk.